this week in environmental science, we'll be taking a look at chapter four, species interactions and community ecology. This lecture will help us understand species interactions, feeding relationships, which include energy flow, trophic levels, and food webs. We'll understand keystone species, the process of succession, potential impacts of invasive species, restoration ecology, and terrestrial biomes. Our story for this chapter is called Black and White and Spread All Over, Zebra Mussels Invade the Great Lakes. Things were looking up for the Great Lakes. Their waters were becoming clearer and cleaner than ever before, and Canadian governments brought industrial pollution under control starting in the 1970s. People started venturing back onto the lakes for recreation, and populations of fish began to rebound. Everything was looking up and positive. Then the zebra mussel arrived. These are black and white little shellfish, about the size of a dime. They attach to hard surfaces and feed on algae by filtering water through their gills. They're native to the Caspian and Black Seas, where Europe meets Asia, but in 1988, they were discovered in North America in Lake St. Clair, which connects to Lake Erie and Lake Huron. People brought the shellfish to our continent by accident when ships from Europe discovered ballast water containing the mussels or their larvae. And within just two years of their discovery, zebra mussels had multiplied and reached all five of our Great Lakes and even in the Mississippi River. In just three more years, they spread to 19 states and two provinces. By 2010, they'd colonized water in 30 U.S. states. You might ask, why are they spreading so quickly? Why are they doing so well? One of the answers lies in the fact that they're not native to here, so they don't have any natural predators that evolved with them. So that reduces competition for them, it reduces parasites and diseases that might affect them, so they're able to persist and do so well and even so much, much as overrun other species that are native to the area. Why all the fuss? Well, for one thing, zebra mussels clog water intake pipes at factories, power plants and municipal water supplies, and wastewater facilities. Clusters of these organisms also damage boat engines and degrade docks, follow fishing gear, and sink voice that ships use for navigation. In these ways, zebra mussels have actually costed the Great Lakes economies an estimated $5 billion in the first decade of their invasion. And they continue to impose costs of hundreds of millions of dollars each year. Zebra mussels also exert severe ecological impacts they eat primarily phytoplankton, those are microscopic photosynthetic algae, and protists and cyanobacteria that drift in open water. And because each mussel filters a liter or more of water every day, zebra mussels can consume enough phytoplankton to deplete populations that other organisms need to eat. Phytoplankton is the foundation of the Great Lakes food web. So its depletion is bad news for the next step up on the food web, zooplankton. Those are tiny aquatic animals that eat the phytoplankton. And it's also bad news for the fish that eat both. Researchers find that water bodies with zebra mussels contain fewer zooplankton and fewer open water fish than bodies of water without the zebra mussels. And although zebra mussels benefit many bottom-feeding animals, they can suffocate native mollusks by attaching to their shells. Zebra mussels are just one of the many invasive species that are affecting ecological communities and human economies today. But the zebra mussel story has a few extra twists. For instance, on the heels of its invasion has come another the quagga mussel, which is a close relative of the zebra mussel from the Ukraine. This one is also spreading through the Great Lakes and beyond. The species is named after an extinct type of zebra called the quagga. 
and is actually replacing the zebra mussel in many locations. In a second twist, today there are signs that the zebra mussel invasion might be losing its steam. In a number of areas, zebra mussel populations have apparently peaked and begun to decline. In some cases, they're being displaced by the quagga mussels, but in others, predation by fish, crabs, and ducks may be driving down their numbers as native predators develop a taste for this invader. Ecologists are monitoring populations closely to see how things will develop. No one expects zebra mussels to disappear completely, but there's some new hope that um, some of their impacts could be reversed and that the ecological communities of the Great Lakes can begin to be restored. By interacting with many species in a variety of ways, zebra mussels and quagga mussels have set in motion an array of changes in the communities that they've invaded. Interactions among species are the threads in the fabric of ecological communities. Ecologists organize species interactions into several main categories, as shown by this chart in this slide. The types of interactions are located in this column starting with competition, and then over in the other columns, we put either a plus or a minus to show the, ex the effect on the species that interacts with it. A minus means a negative impact, and a positive denotes a positive impact. With competition, it's negative for both species. Interactions such as predation, parasitism, and herbivory is positive on one species while negative on another. In mutualism, both species experience a positive effect. Competition occurs with limited resources. Competition is when multiple organisms seek the same limited resource, such as food, water, space, shelter, mates, and sunlight. When the competition is between the same species, we call that intraspecific competition. Usually this is when there's a high population density, so therefore we'd have increased competition. When the competition is between members of different species, we call it interspecific competition, and it strongly affects community composition. This often leads to what's called competitive exclusion in which one species outcompetes the other, so that either the other species has to go extinct or needs to adapt and find a new niche. It also can lead to species coexistence as well. As a reminder, remember that a community consists of different populations of different species interacting with one another in an area. For the results of interspecific competition, the competition is usually subtle and indirect. One species may exclude the other from using the resource, such as how zebra mussels have displaced native mussels in the Great Lakes, and much like how the quagga mussels are now displacing the zebra mussels in the Great Lakes ecosystems. It also can result in competing species being able to coexist where natural selection favors individuals that use different resources or shared resources in different ways. It can also lead to resource partitioning in which competing resource or competing species coexist by specializing. They use different resources at different levels within the ecosystem. They may even share it. But here's a good example of how these birds coexist together and how resource partitioning has occurred between these different species, such as the woodpecker digging deeply into the wood to find insects, the nuthatch here uh, climbing down the trunk looking for insects, the yellow-bellied sapsucker drilling holes to consume sap and insects that are stuck in the sap, and the brown creeper climbs up the trunk looking for tiny insects, each of them having a little bit different way of getting their resources and maybe even at a different level as well. This has also happened in places 
such as the Galapagos Islands, such as how Darwin's finches have evolved different beaks over time through interspecific competition, and last week's story about the Hawaiian honey creepers, how the evolution of those birds has occurred because of the, the different levels of uh, finding their resources. Predation. This is an exploitative interaction. One member benefits and the other is harmed. Examples of this are predation, parasitism, and herbivory. In predation, this is a process by which, one, by which individuals of one species, called the predators, capture, kill, and consume individuals of another species, which we call the prey. Like in the picture here, we have a snake devouring a frog. Predation affects the community, such as the number of predators and prey influences the community's composition, who lives there and how many of each. Predators can themselves actually become prey over time, such as the zebra mussels eat smaller types of zooplankton, but as species adapt and evolve, now some North American predators are starting to eat the zebra mussels such as certain types of fish, ducks, mus muskrats, and crayfish. Predation drives population dynamics. Here we have a chart, a graph at the bottom of our slide. This is interesting. This is actual data that's been kept since before 1850 on the predator-prey relationship of the lynx and the snowshoe hare. As you can see, when there's increased prey, then there's increased predators, and vice versa. When there's uh, increased predators, then that drives the population of the prey animals down. So over time, we see this pattern, and we can see how closely each population affects the other. Predation has evolutionary ramifications. Natural selection leads to evolution of adaptations that make predators better hunters. Individuals that are better at catching prey are able to live longer and healthier lives and have better offspring. So in other words, they're able to not only survive, but reproduce and pass their good adaptations down to their offspring. Then, prey themselves face strong selection pressures because of the, the better predators that they're up against. They're at risk of immediate death, so they develop elaborate defenses against being eaten. Here's some examples of some prey defenses, such as the gecko's camouflage, or the yellow jacket's bright colors to show warning. And then mimicry. When, a threaten, or when threatened, a caterpillar swells its tail with false eye spots looking like a snake's head. That's called mimicry. This is almost like what's called an evolutionary arms race. Over time, as prey develop their defenses, predators get better at hunting them. So prey develop even better defenses and predators develop better hunting skills. So over time it is indeed an evolutionary arms race. And we see these relationships develop between different populations of species. We call it an evolutionary arms race and we can also call it coevolution. Parasites exploit living hosts. Parasitism is a relationship in which one organism, the parasite, depends on another, the host, for nourishment or for some kind of uh, benefit. The parasite harms, but doesn't always kill the host. It can eventually come to that, but it's actually better for the parasite if it doesn't kill the host, at least right away, because the parasite is getting some benefits from the host. 
such as food or a place to live. Tapeworms are an example of parasites that live within a host. Some parasites actually uh, contact their host infrequently. For example, cuckoos and cowbirds are both types of birds who lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And then they let the other birds, we can call them the foster parents, they let them raise their chicks. And often the chicks are much bigger than the actual foster birds' chicks which then outcompetes them for food. So the cuckoos and cowbirds would do better in the nest. Some parasites live on ex the exterior of their host, such as fleas and ticks on a dog or a cat, or the sea lampreys we see in the picture attaching to this fish in the Great Lakes and sucking their blood. Parasitoids. These are insects that parasitize other insects and then kill the host, like a parasitic wasp. They uh, burrow into and kill caterpillars. Pathogens. These are parasites that cause diseases in their hosts, such as protists, bacteria, and viruses. As humans, we know about those because we're infected by those quite often such as influenza B virus. Coevolution, I mentioned that before, this is when hosts and parasites or predator and prey become locked in a duel of es escalating adaptations called an evolutionary arms race. Each evolves new responses to try to outwit the other through natural selection. Herbivory. This is when animals feed on the tissues of plants, and it's widely seen in insects. It may not kill the plant, but affects the plant's growth and reproduction. Plants are not defenseless. They've developed some defenses against herbivory. That can include chemicals that make them toxic or distasteful to the parasite, or thorns and spines, or even irritating hairs. Herbivores, then, may eventually overcome those defenses. Again, there's that evolutionary arms race. In mutualism, two or more species benefit from the interactions with each other. Each partner provides a service, such as a place to live, food, or protection. A symbiosis is a relationship in which one organism lives close in physical contact with another. So, the interactions of mutualism and parasitism are great examples of symbioses. Some ex other examples that are more specific are when microbes live within the digestive tracts of mammals and help to digest their food, and they get a nice home to live in. So, we could say uh, the microbes get fed in a nice home, and then the organism that they live in get some help with digestion and therefore gain uh, more efficient nutrients. Pollination. Bees, bats, birds, and other organisms transfer pollen from one flower to another and therefore help fertilize its eggs. This helps increase species diversity within the plants. Then the bees, the bats, and the birds often get a reward, such as nectar or a meal. Again, a community is an assemblage of populations of organisms living in the same area at the same time, interacting with each other. Interactions determine the structure, function, and species composition of the community. And community ecologists Scientists that study community ecology are interested in how species coexist and interact with one another. Communities change over time, and ecologists like to know why these patterns exist and like to study the interactions between the different organisms within the community to figure out how and why they change. 
Our next topic in this chapter includes studying how energy passes among what are called trophic levels. The word troph, T-R-O-P-H, is Latin for feeder. So basically we're looking at feeding levels in a community. Some of the most important community interactions involves who eats whom. And we can remember from a previous chapter that matter and energy move through a community or move through an ecosystem. Here's the names of some of the trophic levels. Producers and autotrophs, and we'll talk about each of these. Consumers, detritivores, and decomposers. So first of all, producers, also called autotrophs, Auto is Latin for self, and again, troph is Latin for feeder. These are organisms that are able to make their own food through photosynthesis. They include green plants, cyanobacteria, and photosynthetic algae, which are part of the protist kingdom. These organisms have in common that they have chloroplasts in their cells filled with the green pigment chlorophyll. Our next level are the primary consumers. They're the second trophic level. These are organisms that consume producers and include herbivores like deer and insects like grasshoppers that feed on those plants. Our next level is the secondary consumers or the third trophic level. These are organisms that prey on primary consumers. Organisms that are good examples of secondary consumers would be wolves and rodents and birds. Tertiary consumers are our fourth trophic level. These are some top level feeders like predators, uh, hawks, and owls. Once in a while, if the ecosystem is really rich, we could even go up to a next level called quaternary consumers which would be our highest, most specific predators. But most ecosystems only go up to the tertiary consumers. We can't forget about our bottom feeders, detritivores and decomposers. These are organisms that consume non-living organic matter. They include the detritivores, like millipedes and soil insects that scavenge waste products and dead bodies, and also decomposers which break down leaf litter and other non-living materials. These include fungi and bacteria. They enhance the topsoil and recycle nutrients. Without these organisms, all of this dead matter and dead waste would just build up and life like we know it would not exist. They are so important in the recycling of the nutrients in our ecosystems. In the review of food chains, remember that for feeding relationships, all food chains start with energy from the sun and then photosynthetic organisms like the producers creating sugar for themselves, but then for the rest of the community. The herbivores eating the producers, the secondary consumers eating the primary consumer consumers, and so on and so forth up these levels here. And then not forgetting about decomposers and detritivores. In this food chain, notice how the arrows point to the organism that receives the energy. Notice that at each level though, the arrow gets smaller and smaller. Most energy that organisms use in cellular respiration is lost as weight and heat. So there's less and less energy available in each successive trophic level. Going back to this slide, most food chains usually only go up four or five levels because you run out of energy as you make each step in the chain. 
there's also far fewer organisms and far less biomass at the higher trophic levels. Biomass is the mass of living matter. Here's another chart to take a look at that. We have this bug who would be considered a primary consumer feeding on this producer, this leaf. From what it eats, in this chart we have about 17%. The average is about 10%. Actually goes into the growth of its own tissues, which would be then be available for other organisms to eat it. Much of, though, what it's eating is going to be used for energy in the form of cellular respiration. That will not be available to the rest of the food chain. Much of it will also be excreted as feces and waste. That, again, is also not available to the higher levels in the food chain. This is energy loss due to daily living. This is why only about, on average, 10% or so moves up the food chain. And that is also why you can't have that many top-level feeders. Here's another chart to take a look at that with a couple different food chains. 80 to 90% of energy is lost from one level to the next. Remember that on average only about 10% energy moves to the next level, meaning that in any ecosystem we can only have so many hawks or we can have only so many killer whales. So we get what's called an ecological pyramid shape to show these trophic levels. So these words should be familiar by now. We have the producers in the lowest level, and we can have a lot of those because they get their energy directly from the sun, and there's plenty of sunlight to go around. Then we have our primary consumers. Their space gets a little smaller. Then we have the secondary consumers. Their space is smaller yet, and then in this e ecological pyramid, it only goes up to the tertiary consumers. They have the smallest space yet. There's just not enough energy to support that many of them. And remember, only on average about 10% of the energy is left from each level to move to the next level. And that's why they get smaller and smaller as we move up the ecological pyramid. Remember, each of these levels is called a trophic level or a feeding level. Here's a problem for us to solve based on these concepts. Using the ratio shown in this example, let's suppose that a system has 3,000 grasshoppers. Then how many rodents would you expect those 3,000 grasshoppers could support? Well, in this one, if 100 grasshoppers can support 10 rodents, then we do a little ratio there, or cross multiplying and dividing, and we would find that 3,000 grasshoppers can support 300 rodents. Here's another thinker. How many people can the earth support? If we're meat eaters, that means we're feeding on this level of the ecological pyramid. And remember, this level is a higher level than this one over here. Therefore, there's less energy available at this level, meaning that if all humans were meat eaters, completely meat eaters, then there would be less energy to support us. So the earth can actually support more human vegetarians. We're not saying here that everybody should become vegetarians. It's just something to think about. And it, it helps us uh, see how the earth can support more herbivores than it can carnivores. Because herbivores are at a lower feeding level.
outweighing the issues, the footprints in our diets. What proportion of your diet would you estimate consists of me meat, milk, eggs, and other animal products? Would you choose to decrease this proportion in order to reduce your ecological footprint? And describe other ways in which you could reduce your, food, your footprint through your food choices. Those are some questions to kind of make you think. Food webs show feeding relationships and energy flow. A food chain is a series of feeding relationships going from one to the next. But in reality, usually organisms don't just eat one thing. They eat a number of different things. So a better interpretation of how organisms feed in the wild is actually called a food web. This is a visual map of feeding relationships and energy flow among organisms. They're usually greatly simplified and leave out many species that should be included. Some organisms play outsized roles in communities. They're called keystone species. They have a strong or wide-reaching impact far out of proportion to their abundance. And removing a keystone species has substantial ripple effects and can alter a food web greatly. For example, sea otters are a keystone species. Sea otters consume sea urchins that eat kelp in coastal waters in the Pacific. Otters keep sea urchin numbers down, allowing lush underwater forests of kelp to grow, providing habitat for many other species. When otters are absent, the urchins increase and devour the kelp, destroying the habitat and depressing species diversity. Often secondary or tertiary consumers near the tops of food chains are considered keystone species. Top predators control populations of herbivores which might otherwise multiply out of hand and then greatly modify the plant community by overgrazing. Thus predators at high trophic levels can indirectly promote populations of organisms at low trophic levels by keeping species at intermediate trophic levels in check, a, ph a phenomenon known as trophic cascade. For example, government bounties in the United States long promoted the hunting of wolves and mountain lions, which were largely exterminated by the mid 20th century. In the absence of those predators, deer populations grew unnaturally dense and overgrazed forest floor vegetation and eliminated tree seedlings, causing major changes in forest structure. The removal of top predators in the United States was an uncontrolled large-scale experiment with unintended consequences. But ecologists have verified the keystone species concept in controlled scientific experiments. Therefore, we've seen the importance of maintaining our top level feeders, such as wolves and mountain lions in certain ecosystems. There's other types of organisms also that exert strong community-wide effects. These are called ecosystem engineers. They physically modify environments. Beavers build dams across streams, creating ponds and swamps by flooding the land. Prairie dogs dig burrows that aerate the soil and serve as homes for other animals. Ants disperse seeds and redistribute nutrients and selectively protect or destroy insects and plants near their colonies. And zebra and quagga mussels alter the communities that, that they invade by filtering plankton from the water. Now we return to the science behind the story. Scientists Strayer, Hadala, and Conley wanted to determine the zebra mussels impact on fish communities. They looked up data of the pre-invasion versus the post-invasion. They had found that the biomass of phytoplankton fell by 80 percent. The biomass of small zooplankton fell by 76 percent and the biomass of large zooplankton fell by 52 percent. 
Zebra mussels increase filter feeding in the community 30-fold, depleting the phytoplankton and small zooplankton and leaving larger zooplankton with less to eat. Overall zooplankton in invertebrate animals of the open water declined by 70%. However, Strayer had also found that benthic or bottom-dwelling invertebrates in shallow water, especially in the near shore or littoral zone, had increased because the mussel shells provided habitat structure and their feces provided nutrients. These contrasting trends in the benthic shallows and the open deep water led Strayer's team to hypothesize that zebra mussels would harm open water fish that ate plankton, but would help littoral or near shore feeding fish. They predicted that larvae and juveniles of open water fish species would decline in number, grow more slowly, and shift downriver towards saltier water where mussels were absent. Conversely, they predicted that larvae and juveniles of littoral or near shore feeding fish species would increase in number, grow more quickly, and shift upriver to regions of high zebra mussel density. So we see their data here actually confirms their hypotheses and supports it. The first one is the American shad. This is an open water fish. And we can see that pre-invasion, their numbers were increasing, but post-invasion, their numbers went down. The tessellated darter is a littoral or near shore feeding fish. Their numbers were decreasing pre-invasion, but increased after the invasion. And we see their hypotheses are supported. The fish responded in different ways to the zebra mussels and the open water fish population shifted downstream away from the zebra mussels to more saltier conditions where those mussels did not exist and the littoral feeding fish shifted upstream toward the zebra mussels. Overall the data supported the hypothesis that the fish community would respond to changes in food resources caused by the zebra mussels. Yet then, surprisingly, some of the zebra mussels' impacts began to reverse. Populations of native mussels and clams in the Hudson River that had crashed after the zebra mussel invaded, likely because of competition for food, began to stabilize and persist at about 4 to 22 percent of the pre-inversion population sizes. Crustaceans, flatworms, and other invertebrates also rebounded, and several types of zooplankton began to increase. To determine why these changes were occurring, Strayer's research team stepped up monitoring efforts and ran experiments, placing cages to keep up predators around some of the areas of the mussels. They found that mussels within the cages grew larger than mussels outside, indicating that predators were indeed feeding on the mussels and present, preventing most of them from growing to full size. Indeed, Strayer's teams determined that the zebra mussel survival rate had fallen to less than 1% of what it was in the early years of the invasion. Predators like the blue crab were eating more and more of the mussels, and large mussels were becoming rare. As the average size of mussels decreased, their filtering capacity fell by more than 80%, and more zooplankton began to survive. So they wonder, does this mean that the zebra mussel is on its way out? The scientists feel that it's too early to tell but we'll definitely keep monitoring and actually it might provide some hope that Hudson's native systems may recover. This story is a great example of showing how communities respond to disturbances in various ways. A disturbance is an event that has rapid dramatic impacts on environmental conditions such as the removal of a keystone species, fires and floods, and how human impacts have caused major community changes. Resistance is a, how a community resists change and remains stable despite the disturbance. And resilience is a community changes re in response to a disturbance but later returns to its original state and it looks like the Hudson area is showing resilience. Our next topic is on succession. 
Succession follows severe disturbances. Succession is a predictable series of changes in a community after a severe disturbance. Primary succession occurs after a disturbance removes all vegetation and soil life, such as glaciers or drying of lakes, volcanic lava covering the land. Those types of disturbances would remove vegetation and primary succession would occur. The pioneer species would be then the first species that would arrive in a primary succession area, such as lichen, which consists of a symbiosis between fungi and algae. Secondary succession occurs after a disturbance has removed much, but not all of the biotic community, such as after a fire, a hurricane, after logging or farming, only some things have been removed, so then su secondary succession occurs. Aquatic systems can also undergo succession. Ponds eventually fill in to become terrestrial systems, and we're seeing that a lot in uh, parts of Minnesota after glaciers cleared our area and moved out about 10,000 years ago we were left with a lot of ponds and, and wetlands and those areas are being filled in by vegetation year after year and are now becoming terrestrial systems. A climax community remains in place with few changes until uh, another disturbance restarts succession. Communities may undergo shifts Community changes are more variable and less predictable than early models of succession suggested. Conditions at one stage may promote another stage, and competition may inhibit progression to another stage, and chance factors also affect the changes. In other words, the community has a big effect on how and when succession occurs than what we originally thought that it may not be as simple as we once suggested. Once a community is disturbed and changes are set in motion, there's no guarantee that the community will return to its original state. Instead, sometimes communities undergo what's called a phase shift or a regime shift in which the character of the community fundamentally changes. This can occur if some crucial climatic threshold is passed like a keystone species is lost or a non-native species invades. For instance, many coral reef communities have undergone a phase shift and become dominated by algae after people over-harvest fish and turtles that once ate the algae and kept their levels in check. Phase shifts show that we cannot count on being able to reverse damage caused by human disturbance because some changes we set in motion may become permanent. Many ecologists now think that human disturbance is creating wholly new communities that have not previously occurred on Earth. These novel communities or no analog communities are composed of novel mixtures of plants and animals and have no analog or precedent. As we enter more deeply into an age of fast changing climate, habitat alteration, species extinctions and species invasions, scientists predict that we'll see more and more of these novel communities. Here's a frequently asked question. Once we disturb a community, won't it return to its original state if we leave it alone? Well, as we've just learned with succession, that uh, the answer could be no. Our next topic is on invasive species and the situation with the zebra mussels in the Great Lakes region is a great example of an invasive species. Invasive species go by different names such as non-native species or exotic species or introduced species. Whatever name they go by, they're usually introduced to a community by people. Invasive species are non-native to the area that they're brought to and then therefore can become widely spread and dominant in a community. G 
generally, because they don't have any predators that evolved with them there, they're able to do very well and outcompete other species that did evolve there and do have limiting factors against them. They can have major ecological effects. Some examples of invasive species to areas that have uh, destroyed island areas like uh, the Galapagos Islands are pigs and goats and rats. Some invasive species like honeybees actually help people. Here we can see the data set of the invasive species of the zebra mussels and the quagga mussel. And we can see how far they've actually spread across the United States. We can respond to invasive species with control, eradication, or prevention. Eradication is the total elimination of a population, and this is often difficult to accomplish. Control is when we limit the growth and the spread of the invasive species and its impact of a population. Examples are the zebra mussel management. We can remove them manually, we can apply toxic chemicals, we can dry them out, we can deprive them of oxygen, we can introduce predators or diseases to reduce their numbers and stress them with heat, sound, electricity, carbon dioxide, and ultraviolet light. But we have to be careful when using some of these control measures because they could affect other species in the community. These control and eradication methods can be very difficult and expensive. Prevention would actually be the best policy. Predicting where a species might spread is important and analyzing the biology of the organism allows scientists to model the environmental conditions they might live in. For example, in 2007, researchers applied knowledge of how zebra and quagga mussels use calcium from water to create their shells. They mapped high and low risk um, and high risk regions across North America. Can altered communities be restored? Humans have dramatically changed ecological systems and severely degraded systems cease to function. Restoration ecology is the science of restoring an area to an earlier condition. Ecological restoration is the on the ground efforts to restore an area. It's difficult and time consuming and expensive. It's best to protect natural systems from degradation in the first place. Here's some examples of some restoration efforts. There's prairie restoration, where we replant native species and control invasive species, and we used controlled fire to mimic natural fires that would normally occur on a, a prairie region. The world's largest project, project is in the Florida Everglades. Flood control and irrigation removed its water, and populations of wading birds dropped 90 to 95 percent. It'll take 30 years and billions of dollars to restore that natural water flow. Our next topic is a little run through of some of Earth's biomes in which communities of organisms live. A biome is a major regional complex of similar communities recognized by plant type and vegetation type. And you can refer back to this map often to see where some of these biomes are located. If we take a look at our area that we live in, we've got the two different colors of brown, we can see that we live in an area of temperate deciduous forest and temperate grassland. Climate helps to determine biomes. A type of biome depends on temperature, precipitation, soil conditions, and air and ocean circulation. This is a climate diagram and can depict information on temperature and precipitation and show which biomes are possible at each level. Aquatic and coastal systems resemble biomes. 
Various aquatic systems comprise distinct communities, such as coastlines, continental shelves, open ocean, deep sea, coral reefs, and kelp forests. Some coastal systems, like estuaries and marshes, have both aquatic and terrestrial components. Aquatic systems are shaped by water temperature, salinity, that's the amount of solutes or salts that are in solution, and dissolved nutrients, wave action, currents, depth, light, levels and substrate type. Animals, not plants, delineate marine communities. In a temperate deciduous forest, deciduous trees lose their broad leaves each fall and they remain dormant during the winter. Mid-latitude forests include Europe, East China, Eastern North America, and even year-round precipitation, fertile soils, and have forests of oak, beech, and maple. Temperate grasslands. They have more temperature difference between winter and summer. They have less precipitation that supports the grasses, not trees. Can also be called a steppe or a prairie. Once widespread, but have been converted to agriculture. Animals include bison, prairie dogs, ground nesting birds, and pronghorn antelope. Here's a data question for temperate grasslands. How would you explain the dry conditions July to September? Given the temperature and precipitation patterns shown, what role do you think evaporation might play and why? A temperate rainforest, such as at the U.S. coastal and Pacific Northwest, has heavy rainfall, coniferous trees like cedar, spruce, hemlock, and fir, they have moisture-loving animals like the banana slug, and erosion and landslides affect the fertile soil. Most old growth is gone as a result of logging. A tropical rainforest. This is one of the most efficient biomes concerning primary productivity that we studied in a previous chapter. One of the most productive. They occur in Southeast Asia, West Africa, Central, and South America. They have year-round rain and warm temperatures. They're dark and damp and have lush vegetation and have some of the most diverse of species, but have low densities of them. They're very poor acidic soils because the nutrients are in the plants. A tropical dry forest can also be called a tropical deciduous forest plants drop leaves during the dry season. India, Africa, South America, and North Australia have this type of forest. They have wet and dry seasons. They're warm, but have less rainfall, and have been converted to agriculture in much of the region, and therefore would have severe soil erosion. The savanna, such as that that occurs in Africa, probably the most popular savanna, is a tropical grassland interspersed with trees. Precipitation only occurs during the rainy season, and animals gather near water holes. Zebras, gazelles, giraffes, lions, and hyenas are organisms that could be found there. A desert has minimal precipitation and is one of our least productive biomes. A uh, very popular desert is the Sahara Desert in Africa. It is bare and has many sand dunes. Also, the Sonoran Desert is heavily vegetated, though. Temperatures vary widely with day versus night and also seasonally. Sometimes the nights can be very cold and the days being very hot. The soils are high in mineral content but low in organic matter. Animals usually can be nocturnal due to it being cooler at night and can also be nomadic or wandering. Plants have thick spines and thick skins in order to conserve water. The tundra is also not a very productive biome. They can be found in Russia, Canada, and Scandinavia. They have minimal rain and very cold winters. They have a permafrost, which is a permanently frozen topsoil. Residents include polar bears, musk oxen, migratory birds, and caribou, 
also lichens and low vegetation and virtually no trees. The alpine tundra occurs on mountaintops. A boreal fo forest or a taiga in, in occurs in Canada, Alaska, Russia, and Scandinavia. Has a few evergreen tree species, a cool and dry climate with long cold winters and short cool summers. The soils are nutrient poor and acidic. Animals include moose, wolves, bears, lynx, and mi migratory birds. If you've ever seen an Old West movie, you've probably seen the biome called the chaparral. It occurs in small patches around the globe, including some in southwestern United States, in the Mediterranean Sea, Chile, California, and South Australia. They're densely thicketed with evergreen shrubs. It's a highly seasonal biome, mild wet winters and warm dry summers, and has fire resistant plants. In conclusion, biome classification is informative at the broadest geographic scale. Species interactions affect communities. Competition, predation, parasitism, herbivory, mutualism are all examples of species interactions. They cause weak and strong and direct and indirect effects. Feeding relationships are represented by trophic levels and food webs and are best represented by a pyramid shape. Humans have altered many communities partly by introducing non-native species, which can change the whole game of the community. Ecological restoration attempts to undo the changes we have caused can be very expensive and very difficult. Therefore, prevention is the best measure. <laughs>